Uh, we're talking about, about employee-employer relationships today, but in a bigger context about how, um, how the gospel impacts everyday life. The Apostle Paul had been preaching the gospel of Christ throughout the ancient world, and people were starting to come to become followers of Jesus, and some of them were from different sides of the track in terms of uh, the culture. Some were um, husbands, some were wives, some were children, some were parents, and he gives instructions about how do we live now? How does the gospel impact everyday life? And let's read this text. Let me read this text for you, Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now, let me uh, just give you a little background here. Uh, Paul is writing during the late Roman Empire, so first century. And slavery uh, was deeply embedded in the culture at that time. Some have estimated that up to half of the population of the Roman Empire were uh, employed as, as what, what they would have called slaves. Uh, now, that was because Roman citizens by this time believed that work, all kinds of work were kind of beneath them. And so they had people to do their work. Even work like teaching and medical doctors were owned often as slaves by people who had the resources to, to take care of them. Uh, so it was a little different than what we think about with American slavery, but still this was a, um, a kind of a tiered caste system in the ancient world. Those who, who were affluent enough to own slaves and those who, who served and did the menial work and other kinds of work in the culture. Um, by the way... Um, I did a little research, and you probably have done some of this reading yourself, but in the world today, the best estimates are there are still about 30 million slaves in the world today. Uh, forced labor uh, in a lot of the developing world. Uh, sex trafficking is a huge part of that. Uh, there are estimated 60,000 such slaves in, in the United States today. And in fact, uh, the Super Bowl weekend is the largest single sex trafficking incident in America today is the, the upcoming weekend because when you have 400,000 men coming into a city, uh, there are people who take advantage of that. And there's a huge task force in northern New Jersey trying to locate and see what's happening there. But that's not the kind of slavery Paul's talking about. He's talking about kind of a cultural caste system between those who have and those who have not. And he begins to speak to these people because slaves are becoming Christians, masters are becoming Christians. How do we live together? First, the gospel tells us that people have eternal value. People matter to God. Uh, I want to start this discuss discussion off by asking you if you recognize the name Richard Sherman. Anybody? Anybody? See the interview? Uh, Richard Sherman's a defensive back for the Seattle Seahawks who gave a 30-second interview with N Aaron Andrews after the NFC Championship game last Sunday night and set off a social media firestorm that's still going on. All she did was ask him to describe the final play of the game in which he made a spectacular defensive play and saved the game for his team. Uh, instead of being gracious in victory and congratulating his opponent and recognizing his teammates, Richard Sherman went off in kind of this crazy, angry rant, looking right at the TV camera and shouting stuff like, I'm the best corner in the league. You come at me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree. That's what you're going to get. And he just went off. Okay? And on and on he went. And Aaron Andrews, if you saw it, looked extremely uncomfortable. And the interview was suddenly cut short and they went somewhere else. I think they were afraid of what he was going to say. But it sparked all kinds of discussion and opinions. Some called him a thug. I saw that the next day, that Monday, the word thug was used like 650 times on sports TV. Most of it had ever been used in one day before. I don't know who keeps track of that sort of things. Some called him much worse, saying it was selfish, arrogant, representative of everything bad about professional sports. Others loved it, called the interview raw and honest, loved it because it was great entertainment. Many saw the incident as having strong racial overtones. After a few days of reading about it, thinking about it, I just, I've come to the conclusion it was a little bit of all those things, a little bit of both. Richard Sherman's a very bright and talented guy. His backstory is he grew up in Compton, California, around gangs and violence, uh, was the salutatorian of his high school class, taking all honors AP classes, got a scholarship to Stanford where he graduated. First guy in 50 years from his high school to go to Stanford on a scholarship. But 
that day, in those 30 seconds, he displayed a form of disrespect to his opponent, to the game itself, even to his teammates, which he later apologized for. On the other hand, the rest of us who kind of judged the guy after hearing 30 seconds of his comments, just after he had made the biggest play in his career in a sport that is quite often the modern equivalent of gladiator fighting, a sport that's violent and, and intense, and that's why we like it, to, to judge him based on those words is a little bit disrespectful itself and even a little bit hypocritical. So for our purposes today, I think it was an interesting example of, I think, what Paul's trying to tell us about, what he's trying to teach us in Ephesians. He's talking to slaves and masters about how they're to treat each other. Now, in the ancient world, it's a bit different, like I said, than the slavery we think of in America and our history. But these are still two groups that have basically an oppositional relationship. There's a lot to dislike, distrust about the other group, and maybe even to hate each other. But both masters and slaves were hearing the gospel. Both were becoming followers of Christ, and they needed to know how to live together. So he speaks to slaves first. Think of these people as sort of the modern equivalent of household employees, maybe blue-collar jobs, lower-level employees. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Then he speaks to masters, employers, bosses, executives. He says, and masters, treat your slaves the same way. Do not threaten them. Now, why does he say that? He continues, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, in other words, God is watching you, and there is no favoritism with him. What's that mean? Well, no favoritism goes to the way God sees and values people. The gospel tells us that no human being is intrinsically more or less valuable to God than any other. Why? Because we are all created in his image, male, female, slave, master, Jew, Gentile, Peyton Manning, Richard Sherman. This was a radical idea in the ancient world and still is a radical idea today. I saw a story uh, a couple of years ago about a pastor who uh, accepted a call to a new church. Uh, so he had been interviewed and all that, but he hadn't, he hadn't yet been on the job. So when, on his first Sunday when he went to his new church, since most of the people didn't know him well, didn't recognize him, he put on a disguise. He went to that church disguised as a homeless man let his hair grow, looks uh, uh, kind of uh, slovenly, dressed like a homeless guy, and he just walked into the church to see how he got treated. And he just watched all day as he was asked to sit back here, and as people kind of walked away from him. And then the next weekend, he preached his first sermon at that new church and revealed what he had done. And he was able to share with the people both what he found positively and negatively about how they reacted to him when they thought he was this or that. Now, here at this church, we have similar issues sometimes, and we try to do everything we can to accommodate and help if someone shows up like that. The only case in which we will, will do something else is if we feel like somebody is, has a mental issue and is threatening to children or threatening to our people, or if you show up naked. And if you don't know the naked story, ask another guy. Here at team, we had a, we had a naked man here at team a few years ago. Uh, but the gospel tells us that people matter. People matter. Slaves matter and masters matter. And that leads us to the second point, which is the new point. And when I redid this outline this week, I added the point. The second point today you can write in is the gospel tells us how we do our job matters. It tells us people matter and how we do our jobs matter. Over the years, I've told you guys stories about my grandfather on my, my, my mother's side, uh, a guy, uh, uh, my, and we called him Pop or Poppy. And Pop lived with our family on and off while I was in college for about four or five years. And looking back, we now believe that Pop had a form of Alzheimer's at that time in his life, a kind of dementia that made living in the here and now just impossible for him. He was stuck somewhere in his distant past, maybe, maybe 40 or 50 years earlier. In his mind, our home was a business of some kind. It was a little bit unclear what kind of business. And we were all working for my father, uh, who is my, uh, Pop's son-in-law. And all of us were employees of my dad. And, my, that's the, and Pop could make sense of life if you talked to him like we were all employees. Other than that, he really couldn't make sense of life. Well, one day uh, we were having dinner together and my, I could tell Pop was upset about something. He, was, he sat right across from me at the table. And he, he didn't say a word all dinner. He just ate his food. He looked down. He just looked angry. And it turns out that, that my dad um, had found uh, a bunch of mail in Pop's room. He had been, he'd been stealing mail because he thought it was his job. He'd been taking our mail, taking neighbors' mails. He had paychecks from people in his, in, all wrapped up in, in rubber bands in his, in his room, hidden away. My dad found them and took them to get the mail back to where they belonged. It made Pop mad because he thought he was being punished. Or, it was really a weird thing. But he was mad at my dad. 
And so the whole meal, he sits there, didn't say a word, just looking down, scowling, eating his food. We all finish dinner, and everybody gets up to clean up dinner except for Pop and me. I am just sat there with him. He's right across from me. Everybody's cleaning up, and, and after a few minutes, everybody's out of the room, just he, me and Pop. He looks up at me, and he goes, Sst, to get my attention. That's what he would do to get your attention. I looked up and said, what, what's up, Pop? He goes, and he, nod, he nods over his shoulder like that to my dad in the kitchen. He goes, see that sucker in there? I said, yeah. He goes, he wouldn't be worth a nickel without me, he said. And it made me laugh because he was just so angry and he was criticizing the boss and, and it was just funny because the employee, employer relationship was foremost in his mind. Now here, Paul's talking specifically to slaves here. That is, those who would be sort of in the employee category in our culture. Not bosses, not managers, sort of rank and file employees. And the majority of humanity actually falls into this category when you think about it. Most of us are not technically slaves, but if you think about it, we have, in a way, sold our bodies or, and our minds and our energy to someone for specific services for an employee-employer relationship. This is what Paul's talking about. He says, first, obey with respect and fear. There's two kinds of respect. First, there's positional respect. That is positional respect for someone who's in authority over you. Master, boss, manager, owner of the company. A professional kind of respect. Be a good employee. Obey means to follow directions. It means to follow orders. It means to do your job. But there's also a personal kind of respect. He says obey just as you would obey Christ. This changes the game a little bit. Because there is a way of respecting a position while disrespecting the person. Isn't that true? It's very easy to do. I did it for a while here years ago. There was a senior pastor that I was working under who over a period of months I kind of came to dislike personally. Did, just didn't like the guy. I respected his position, did my job, but I felt and I, got, I eventually felt kind of convicted about that, that I was, I was, that was the wrong way to go about it. So I tried to change my attitude and get to know him better, and it did change our relationship, and it changed the way I felt about my job. It's easy to respect a position and disrespect a person. Paul says both are important. Respect the position and respect the person. Se secondly, he says, serve with sincerity. What's it mean to serve with sincerity? It means when they are looking and when they are not looking. This is a form of integrity in the workplace. Some of you may have seen the video that went viral a couple of weeks ago about the mail carrier, the mail person. There was a lady in a mail truck and somebody had their security camera on and nobody was home and she didn't know she was being washed. And instead of parking the, the, the mail truck out in the street and walking the box package all the way up and putting it at the door, she just hopped the curb, drove the truck right across the yard, up to the porch, and tossed the package out of the window of the truck onto the porch, and then drove away over the yard. And they had it on camera, and because she thought nobody was looking. Paul says, work the same way. Serve the same way if the boss is watching or the boss is not watching. Again, easy to do it the other way. Thirdly, he says, serve wholeheartedly as if serving the Lord. That means go above and beyond. Do your work wholeheartedly. I want to use an example here of my friend Dawit, who sits right down here. You may not know Dawit, but Dawit uh, lived his early life in Ethiopia. He was a university-trained nurse there. But when upheaval came in that country, he had to flee with his family and became a refugee. Wound up in this country, could not get the same kind of job because his university degrees didn't transfer. Ended up working other kinds of jobs. And today he works maintenance here at our West Campus for our church. But he does his job with such joy and passion. If you know him at all, that's what Paul's talking about. Serve wholeheartedly, whatever your role, because that's what you've been put here to do. Now, what's interesting here is what Paul does not say. He doesn't encourage slaves to organize, to revolt, or to strike. He doesn't. He tells them to be great employees. Talk more about that in just a minute. Then he turns his attention to masters, to those who have authority and position. He says, the main thing is do not threaten them. Do not threaten those who work for you. Again, interesting. He doesn't tell them to set their slaves free. He doesn't question the master's authority or position. He doesn't question their need to run an effective business or company. He doesn't question the economics of the boss-employee relationship. He talks about managing by threat, managing with fear and intimidation. He's talking about bullying people just because you can. It's kind of what Willie was doing in that little episode of Duck Dynasty. I'm the boss. I make the rules. I am the law. 
See, there is a way of leading and managing people that is purely positional. I'm the boss. I'm in charge. You'll do it my way or else. And there's another way of leading and managing that is relational, that values people. And my guess is we've all worked for each kind of boss, for different kinds of bosses. And Paul wants to make sure that those in authority know, thirdly, that the gospel tells us how we treat people matters. People matter. How we do our job matters, but how we treat people matters as well. Years ago, um, I knew a lady here at church, knew her family, knew her son through youth ministries. Uh, a, a dear lady passed away maybe 10 years ago now, uh, but she had had a, a long history of medical issues. Um, had a debilitating disease that required her to have like 20 surgeries as an adult. And then eventually uh, she had uh, kidney failure and needed a kidney transplant. So she was going to have that transplant up in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota Hospital. So I uh, drove up there with her son uh, the day before the surgery just to be with them during that surgery process. And I'll never forget what happened the night before her surgery. I went in to visit her in the hospital. And she was having it done there specifically for a certain doctor, the best transplant surgeon in, in the Midwest was at that hospital. It was a teaching hospital. I happened to be in her room visiting uh, when this doctor came in with a whole entourage of young doctors that he was evidently teaching, interns or something. And they all came in, he, he and about nine or ten of these other doctors that were crowded into her room, and she was laying in there in her bed, the di all you know, swollen up because she had all the, all the fluids in her already. Uh, had, she was, she was, had, had so many surgeries, so many issues, and... Um, and, and he spoke, he, he too was talking to these other doctors about her as if she wasn't there. She was sitting there, wide awake, listening to him. This was her doctor. And I was sitting there. He didn't even acknowledge her, didn't say hello to her, didn't use her name. And he was talking to her as if he were the, sort of the center of the show. And at, at one point he said, like, look at this woman, for example. Look at her. She looks 10 years older than she is biologically just because of her situation. And that was the phrase. She looks 10 years older than she actually is. And when he said that, without even addressing her with her name, I could see the pain and the humiliation just flicker across her face briefly because I knew her. And one of the regrets of my professional career is that at that moment, I didn't stop him. He was a powerful doctor, famous guy. But I wish I would have stopped him in mid-sentence and said, hey, hang on here a second. Who do you think you are? Do you know this woman? Let me tell you about the beauty and strength of this woman that I know that's before you. Let me tell you about her first. First of all, she has a name. Second of all, she has a family. And third of all, you don't tell, tell, talk about a woman, her, her appearance, right in front of all these other men who are strangers. The second regret is I didn't punch him right in the nose. Right at, the, right at that moment, because that's what he deserved. Patrick Lencioni in his book um, talked about, talking about uh, five signs of a, of a lousy job, or three signs of a terrible job, t tells a story about an uh, emergency room doctor friend of his that he went to visit in the emergency room, and he was showing uh, Lencioni around the, the, around the emergency room, all the stuff that, that went there, introduced him to the doctors and so forth. And then he said, hey, I want, I want to introduce you to somebody, and took him kind of behind the scenes to the guy who was sort of the janitor for the emergency room. A guy named, uh, I don't remember his name, but I'm going to call him Jose. He said, hey, I want you to meet Jose. Jose is the best at, at what he does. I come in here every day, and this, uh, this operating room is absolutely the best, the cleanest I've ever seen. I want you to meet this guy that makes it all happen. So he made a hero out of the lowest level employee in that emergency room. And that's the only said he was stunned that this doctor not only knew the man and knew the man's name and what he did, but knew his wife's name and knew his children's names and would ask him about them because he treated people as if they were important. Paul says here, And masters, treat your slaves the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. He's talking to the people who have, who have authority. Uh, the equivalent in our culture might be executives, bosses, managers of people, people who have power and authority. He's saying that the person's role in a company, the person's job description does not define their value. It's significant. Their value is defined by the gospel. And again, this is revolutionary in the ancient world, and it's revolutionary in our, our world today. Back to the question of why Paul doesn't tee up cultural slavery. Why doesn't he, uh, tee, and Jesus never did either. Uh, the, the whole New Testament is written during the, ancient, during the end of the ancient Roman Empire, one of the most corrupt regimes ever to, to be on the face of the earth. And they don't tee up cultural corruption. They don't tee up political corruption. They never tee up slavery as something that ought to be, ought to be fought against. They tee up the gospel. Why? 
Well, because the New Testament is written, really written about the gospel. It's about personal transformation. And when the gospel takes root in a person's life and in a culture, slavery then becomes unsustainable. That's the direction the gospel uh, uh, approaches. You can attack slavery systemically and nobody ever gets to know the gospel. You can attack it through the gospel and eventually slavery crumbles because people being seeing each other with, as people of value. That's how the New Testament goes at it. And that's what happens here. Christianity is one of the driving forces behind ending slavery around the world, but it attacks it not directly, but indirectly through changing people's hearts and attitudes. Here's what Jesus says about the whole issue. Matthew chapter 20, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man, referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He says that no matter what your role is, you can serve. If you're slave, you can serve. If you're master, you can serve. Because Jesus himself came to serve. I saw a story last week about um, Brad Stevens, who's the head coach of the Boston Celtics now. But up until this year, he was the head coach at Butler University. And when he was at Butler, he had an interesting practice, just a personal habit. When the team bus would get to um, an arena or to a hotel on the road, he'd hop out first and he'd just open the bins and start unloading the bags. He's the head coach. He used to start unloading the bags from under the bus. And everyone else would follow, assistant coaches, uh, Players, stars, scrubs alike would all start unloading bags. Because if the head coach was doing it, everybody did it. And it changed the entire culture of the team. And the players to this day refer to that act as being that which drew them together as a team and made them a great team. I've shared this before, but uh, years ago I read a novel called Gates of Fire, written by Stephen Pressfield. It's about the Battle of Thermopylae, which was popularized recently in a movie called 300. But it's about, about the Spartans and their defense of this area of land. But toward the end, he talks about his, the king of the Spartans named Leonidas. And here's how he talks about the king who had all the authority, but a king who served. He says, I will tell his majesty what a king is. A king does not abide within his tent while his men bleed and die upon the field. A king does not, does not dine while his men go hungry, nor sleep while they stand at watch upon the wall. A king does not command his men's loyalty through fear, nor purchase it with gold. He earns their love by the sweat of his own back and by the pains he endures for their sake. That which comprises the harshest burden, a king lifts first and sets down last. A king does not require service of those he leads, but provides it to them. He serves them, not they, him. That's what Paul's talking about. Here's the three questions I want you to deal with around your table today. Should be fun to have a conversation about these things. First, have you ever had a job that you felt was dehumanizing in some way? Have you ever had a job that you felt in some way just dehumanized you, made you less than a person? And what was the job? Why did that work that way? What made it that way? Secondly, have you ever worked in an environment where the employees routinely disliked or disrespected management? What caused the animosity, and was there ever a solution to that particular animosity? And thirdly, have you ever had a boss who demonstrated servanthood in the way he managed you or managed his employees? So look at both sides of the equation. Most of us have lived on both sides of that in our work lives. Just talk about it. What do you learn from that as applied to the Scripture today? Get some coffee, have a donut, and let's wrap you up right before 7 o'clock.